I'd like for you to take your Bible, if you would. Make sure I'm on the right page here. Uh, Exodus chapter 17. Boy, somebody, while I'm gone, come and clean my pulpit out. It is full of stuff. I don't know what all this stuff is. So maybe somebody could volunteer for that or something. I don't know. Uh, Exodus chapter 17. If you would, please. We're following God's people through the wilderness. They've been brought out of bondage. They have followed the pillar of cloud during the day, which is a picture of Jesus in the clouds. He's coming in the clouds. So it's a picture of Jesus coming in the clouds and the pillar of fire by night. It's a picture of the Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And um, I will hide its words in, thy heart, in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And um, so it's a picture of the Word of God. They're following that during the daytime, during the nighttime. And yes, God did lead them at, at times during the night, apparently. Um, apparently God would, would move in the middle of the night. And I guess somebody went around knocking on everybody's tent and saying, Everybody get up, God's moved, we gotta go. And they would follow God because they did not know the way themselves. That's us. We don't know the way. We don't know how to get where we want to be. I want you to remember that part of it. None of us knows. I mean, we might we have an idea of what we want and where we want to be. So I always try to, as I'm preaching this, I, and God's given me the text and He's kind of given me the idea. I'm asking God, God, how does this then apply to let's say that uh, somebody, somebody here or somebody watching online, you consider yourself part of our church. And there is a place that you want to be in life. And I'm not talking about moving somewhere. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, being successful in your career or whatever. I don't know. God can bring that along too if he, if he so chooses. But the things that are absolutely most dear to you as you grow in the Lord, if you're an adult, then hopefully you would want to, as an, as an adult Christian, satisfy and be a blessing to your Creator, to your Maker, to your God, to the One who led you out of the bondage that you were in. I, in my life, and, you know, as I think back, I think even as a, the smallest child that I can remember back to, I've always believed in God. Just always believed in God. Don't know why or how, I just always did. And it's always, I can remember praying prayers before I ever went to Bible camp when I was nine and, and gave my life to the Lord. I can remember praying prayers even before that. And I'm not talking about romper room prayers or anything like that. I'm talking about just... Laying in bed and asking God for things like a child would. I'm not saying that to brag or boast or anything like that, but that's just where, where my heart has been and it's where it is now. I'm 57 years old, it'll be 58 this May, and uh, I can tell you that I still pray that I can be pleasing to my God. That's what I want. I don't want to follow the world. I don't want the world's junk. I don't want the mess that this world is in. I certainly don't want that. What I want is to be right with God. And on any given day or any given night or any given moment, know in the deep recesses of my heart that when or if I die, I'm going to heaven. That's what I want to know. Now there's other things that I want. I want a strong and happy marriage with my wife. I want that a lot. I want a good relationship with my children. They're all adults now. And I want a good relationship with my children. I want to be, as, as, as the Bible tells us fathers to be, 
to not provoke my children unto anger. And I've done that before. I have done that. I've had to repent. Listen, there ain't, ain't nothing like having to repent to your own children for stupid things that you did or said to them or did in their presence or said in their presence. Nothing like it in the world. But I want to be right with them. I, listen, I've heard preacher stories and known of preachers who were nothing but hypocrites. Nothing but hypocrites. And their children knew it. Growing up in that house, they knew daddy preached one thing, preached one way at church and at home. It was awful. I don't want that. I've seen a lot of preachers make a lot of mistakes. I've made a lot of my own. And I don't want to make any more. And I don't want to make the mistakes that I've seen other preachers make. I want to be a good grandfather. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good minister of the word of God. I want to be a good evangelist. Uh, in the coming next three weeks, I want to be a good missionary. I want to do the work of an evangelist. I want to teach. I want to preach. I want God to use me. I want God to bless. Are there, are there uh, stumbling blocks in my way? You bet there are. There are in yours. So why wouldn't there be in mine? And so that's, I was thinking about that and thinking about just how I can, since I don't know how to be any of these things. I mean, I've tried the wrong ways. Now I want to try the right way. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, and I've also tried to apply this to people that have had addictions, alcohol, drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, pornography, sex addictions, whatever it is, whatever you get hooked on. Uh, right now, everybody's hooked on cigarettes and vapes and marijuana. And, and uh, I tell you what, that marijuana thing is going to eat this state of Missouri up. It is absolutely going to destroy us. We're, we're going to end up like Portland, Oregon. God help us. But that's where it's headed. And those of you that have had addictions and struggled with different things in life that you could not break, you could not shake, you've tried, you've tried to get there on your own. The problem is you don't know what. How to get there. You don't know the way. So how are you going to get to some place where you're just going to make it up as you go? That won't work. And I want you to follow me now in the scriptures. Exodus 17 verse 1. I got to watch my time here. Oh my goodness. We got, we got children to bathe here in a minute. All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin, which is... Shen or Sinai, the Sinai Desert, Sinai uh, area, after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Now why do you think God did that? Why do you think God led them to a place where there was no water? Water for us right now is about the easiest thing in the world for us to get. We can get it out of our taps in our house. Uh, we can get it lake, streams, wherever. Uh, you can go to Walmart, Costco, Sam's. You can go buy bottled water. Uh, by the way, Chris, don't drink the water. And don't, don't, yeah, don't use the ice either. Uh-uh, uh, -uh, uh, -uh. Bad. Um, but God led them to a place where they didn't know how to get water. And God did that for a reason. Verse 2, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Stomped their foot. Give us water. And the people thirsted. And wherefore, oh, oh, look, and Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you, notice that I have that underlined. Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And I'm going to give out some doctrines that I know people believe. I don't think anybody here, but I know people believe them. 
And uh, I want to tell you something. You're going to be guilty of tempting God by following some of the ways you're following. Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? This is the second time in three chapters that Israel has complained and fussed against Moses and against God. It's the second time already. And we know from Scripture that they're going to do it again several more times. And you would think, well, God's surely, God's just going to put, not going to put up with that. And He's going to throw them out. Or He's going to let them go back to Egypt. Or He's just going to let them die in the wilderness. But did you know God never did that? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Now look at verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. <sighs> Boy, I've prayed that prayer a couple times. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. And take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy, what? Rod. Who is that rod? Wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock. This is the place where God told him to smite it. The second place, the second time, he told him to speak to it, but that's not what Moses did. Moses smote it. But in this case, here he's doing what God told him to do. So, who, who is the rod, who is Moses, and who is the rock? You've got three choices. A is Christ, B is Jesus, C is Jesus Christ. Which is your choice? All of the above. I just, that's not one of the choices. It, what I'm saying is, no matter what you pick, you're going to be right. He's all three of them. Isn't that something? Oh, he, uh, by the way, who's the water? Jesus. Isn't that something? You're looking, you're having your eyes open to something that the Jews to this day don't know who it is. They don't know, they don't know who it is. So anyway, behold, I will stand there, verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord. We're going to touch on that for a minute. Saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now you might do well to underline that part of that verse is the Lord among us or not it is a question to be honest with you that I've asked God are you with me or not I've had my doubts I've had my times in the wilderness thirsting and angry that I didn't know the way I didn't know where the water was I don't know how to get it angry with God angry with my family angry with the church angry with everybody and then found out that I really was only angry at myself let's pray father I ask your blessings on your word Lord help me to deliver it in a timely manner but father also Lord to just bring to witness and bring to bear Lord the meaning of this passage for all of those who hear Lord, that you would bless those who are on a journey, and those who struggle, Father, with various temptations, various sins, various weaknesses, things, Lord, that they are addicted to. Father, they don't know the way. And it's frustrating. And we get angry, and we get upset. And God, we ask for your mercy and for your forgiveness. 
And Father, I pray, dear God, you'd open her eyes to your word and make it a blessing today. Lord, in my weakness, God, would you be strong for these people? And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. I want to get back to, I'm going to kind of touch on a couple things at a time. Number one, what the Bible says there in verse two, wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Somebody describe for me, if you can, what it means to tempt the Lord, what you think it means uh, to tempt the Lord, to, to, what do you think that means? Anybody got it? Go ahead, Sister Sandy. Okay, that could be that could work. Yes. Knowing what God can do, but then say it in a way that you don't think you will or can. Think about this. Here's one of the examples of tempting the Lord. Jesus promised to the apostles uh, when he when he was going to send them out to, to build the church after, after he's left. He said, the Spirit's going to come on you. And he said, um, uh, you shall, I can't remember it, uh, I can't remember it word for word, but he, he talked about if uh, I'll give you power to tread on scorpions and serpents. So, you know, number one, the, the serpents and the scorpions can't hurt them. And he said, uh, you know, if, if a serpent bite you, it, it, won't, it won't kill you. If you drink poison, it, that won't kill you. And uh, so people look at that now. Generally, we have, there's, there's a, a whole pocket in this country of, of what we call snake handling churches. And they're still there. They still exist. And if you go into uh, East Tennessee, East Kentucky, and in those hills, West, West, uh, West Virginia, and in those places, you're going to find snake handling churches. They're out in the woods. But they're still out there. And they got drums and they get that they get that beat of that music going and they get everybody up there to dancing and I mean they what they do is that they get a spirit in them but it's not the holy spirit. It is not the holy spirit. Those people are a long way from God in their doctrine. And so what they will do is they will say, "Oh God said we could do that. God said we could do that. God said if we did this then he they would now let to he wouldn't allow it to kill us." And so they reach in a they reach in a big old basket or a big old cage pull out a great big venomous snake, play with that thing, twirl it around its arms, tempt, I mean tempt the snake. I dare you to bite me. I dare you to bite me. Lo and behold, they get bit and some of them die. Do you know what they're guilty of? They are guilty of tempting God. Just because God said He would does not mean that you can force God into a situation where you're going to make Him do it. You see, uh, let, me, let me get to the place. Y'all know where in Matthew 4, this is the devil tempting Christ. We, we know this is related to it. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. That's the stupidest thing anybody could ever ask me. Hey, Mike, get up on top of this church now and jump off. Now listen, I've had some people probably said that behind my back. I guarantee you, over the years... <laughs> I wish he'd get out on the church and jump off. Um, but I, I mean, even our parents say, when you say, well, why did you do that? Well, Charlie, Charlie was doing it. And I just, if Charlie told you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? I saw that. Little monster boy up there going, yeah, I'd do it. <laughs> Ask your daddy. Mason, ask your daddy about jumping off a bridge. Huh? I'm telling you, he told Jesus to jump off, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands thou shalt, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now let me tell you a very quick story. I was, I was part of a singing group from our college uh, in, in the summer between semesters in 1985 uh, from like May until uh, the end of July. And we were in um, Wyoming driving, and we had driven all night 
I drove for a few hours at the beginning of the trip. Some other guys drove. We did the two-hour shifts, and the, the president of the college was driving, and he asked me, he said, Mike, are you awake? And I said, yeah. He said, could you take over and drive for me? There's a, there's a truck stop up here five miles away. Just get us down to the truck stop. We'll eat. We'll change drivers, and we'll get on down the road. I said, okay. And if you this part of Wyoming, it, it, it looks like it's just all flat, except where the highway was. The highway was up on like a plateau deal. And lo and behold, I got in behind the wheel of that thing and I saw the sign for the truck stop three miles away. And no sooner I saw that, I mean, I went to sleep and I was in the far lane over here. Remember, the speed limit was 55 back then. And I probably hit that guy. The, the guy in front of me was in the other lane and I drove over and hit the rear end of his car doing probably about 65 miles an hour. I looked at the speedometer and I said, oh no, we hit a car. And I'm telling you, had I not hit that car, we would have, my, the van was going this way. It would have hit the shoulder and rolled down the hill. Because there wasn't none of the belt. I'm telling you, God sent angels to bear us up. And you know what, I, you know what trouble I got out of it? These guys were, were like miners. They worked in a mine. They made buku money. And the cop told me, he said, they, they got a brand new Ford pickup truck in there. They drove this old piece of junk to go to work every day. It's probably ain't worth 500 bucks, so don't worry about it. And he said, I'm just going to write you a ticket for doing 65 and a 55. It don't, won't be any points on your record. And it's a $15 ticket. I handed him 20 bucks. I would have given him the five if you'd have let me. But God used angels to save me alive that day. I didn't tempt God by just saying, hey, God said if I drove off this cliff, he'd save me. Now, I want to tell you, I want to tell you about some people. They are generally, they are fundamentalist in their doctrine. But it's not just in fundamentalism now. There is a doctrine called extreme grace. And in, I know inside some fundamentalist churches, they have this belief in once saved, always saved, so bad that they have said i have read their post on facebook they have said i can get the mark of the beast and i won't go to hell you are tempting god go ahead and do it go ahead and do it get go ahead get the mark of the beast and then show god now god you've got to save me now because i believe once saved always saved they're tempting god up pastor's son that I know who is also a pastor I know him well has gotten off into what they call extreme grace he told his daddy daddy I can drink all the liquor I want to I can even have affairs if I want to and I don't have to ask forgiveness God's grace is so strong it's automatically wiped off you're tempting God is what you're doing let me go back in scripture a little bit Deuteronomy 6.16, 6, that's the script, that's the law. You should not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Messiah. He specifically pointed out this story here. And then he said in Malachi chapter, turn your Bible there, Malachi chapter 3. He said, your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? You know what they're saying? You don't have to keep the law to be saved. You don't have to do anything to be saved. Gary, I've had, there, there's a crazy guy up in Chicago that, oh, I'd say about 10 years ago, he started making videos against me. He set me up on a phone call one time to get me to say something, and he clipped out just little pieces of what I said to make it look like I said something I didn't mean. His belief was that even if you pray to ask God for salvation, that is a work, and you believe in works, salvation. That's stupid. So he's one of these guys that believes that God saves you, and you can be in the pit of sin itself, and no plan on leaving, and still go to heaven. There are even some people who have said, they have written it out and said, 
that obviously there must be a place in heaven where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because the, um, the servant who didn't do well, he was uh, asked by the master to hold on to this money and he didn't do what his master told him to do. And so he was cast into a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there are these people who say, well, well, you know, once saved, always saved. There must be a place in heaven where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Tempting God. I'm telling you. If you, can, if you think you can sin all you want to. And God is not going to ask you to repent. God's not going to give you, God's not going to chasten you. God's not going to do anything about it. And you can just leave it and do whatever you want to and think you're going to heaven. You're tempting God. Verse 15. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. In other words, they exalt, watch this. They exalt Jay-Z and Snoop Dogg. And they exalt uh, who else sings this nasty music? Huh? Ice tea? Boy, you're showing your age. Yeah, he ain't, he ain't done that in years. Beyonce, Mariah Carey, all these sluts and nasty people doing this, doing this vulgar, vulgar dances, vulgar rap. Um, Lady Gaga and all these people. They believe that those people are uplifted in their minds. They set up these people, the wicked people. Hey, I'm talking about the people that voted for Joe Biden. Yep. Then they that feared, verse 16, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Do you see that phrase, feared the Lord? That's one of the seven spirits of God. You see, somebody might say, I can jump off a cliff and God will have to save me. But those that fear the Lord say, you know what? I'm not going to make God do that. Verse 17, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in, the day, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, because, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Them that serve not God tempt God. And you ought to be real careful about going about your sin and saying, well, God has to forgive me anyway. You ought to be real careful about that. If you've got to fear the Lord, when God, when God gets ready to tan your hide with a rod, you'll let Him do it. I never, in all the years that I got whippings at home, I never ran from my mother one time. I mean, I crawled on my belly across the bed while she was whooping on me, but I never ran from her. I lied to her a couple times to not get the whipping, but she figured it out anyway. And I'm telling you, my mama put in me the fear of mama and the fear of the Lord at the same time. That's tempting God. Now, um, let me go on to this. All right. So now Moses has smitten the, wet, the rock and water comes pouring out. Ephesians 5 tells us that water is a picture of the Bible, the Word of God, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. Now here's a miracle for you. Water does not come out of rocks, does it? No, this is something different. This is something that you would have never thought of just like crossing the bottom of the Red Sea while the, wa while the water was a wall on both sides of you. You never would have thought of that either, much less even if you thought about it, you couldn't have done it. Just like getting water from a rock, you would have never thought that even if you would have thought it, you would have not known how to do it. So what God's doing here in your life right now 
is he's forcing you to trust only him. Does that make sense to everybody? If you trust yourself, you will fail. If you trust others, you will fail. They're, your friends will fail you. In fact, your friends will send you to hell if you ain't careful. You can follow some people all, the, the way too far. And all the things that you wanted. You wanted to be clean. You wanted to be sober. You, you, didn't, you didn't want the drugs in your system. You didn't want the alcohol. You didn't want the pornography. You didn't want anything like that. Or you want, you want a stable, happy home. You want your children to love you. Listen, I, I've got it in my mind when, that when it's my time to go, I'm surrounded by 200 of my family that just can't even get in the room. There's so many of them. Because they want to be around me when I pass from this life to the next. That's my idea of heaven on earth. Amen. Now, God's got a new way. We already seen it. Moses cried unto the Lord saying, what shall I do unto this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod. Well, I mentioned that rod. In Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's Christ. And then in verse 10, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek. See, we were set up to be saved long time ago. And his rest shall be glorious. Somebody say amen. When you rest in Christ, you rest. When you finally give it over to God and let God have it for real, you'll be at rest. And it shall uh, come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. He's coming again. And when he comes again, he's going to recover the remnant of his people which shall be let from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall, shall assemble the outcasts of who? This is why you should not stand for Palestine. You should stand for Israel. He shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and shall gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That's what God is going to do. That's what the rod. And the rod is Christ. Moreover brethren. I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all our fathers. Are, here's the rock. We're under the cloud. And all pass through the sea. Verse 2. And we're all baptized unto Moses. In the cloud and in the sea. We talked about that. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. That was the manna. That I preached on. And verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So we have Christ the rock. Christ the rod. Christ Moses. Christ the water. Christ the manna. He is all and in all and in you all. Somebody say amen. Verse 5, but with many of them God was not well pleased. So I'm wondering this morning, is God, see that's, that's what I started out with. I want to please God. I want to please my wife. I want to please my children, my grandchildren. I want to please you people. I want you to be happy and satisfied with me as your pastor. God knows I've been here way longer than I th ever thought I'd be. And um, I'm thankful for it. I'm not as thankful as I should be, but I'm thankful for it. That God has allowed me to be here. And I want to be a blessing to everybody here. 
and to everybody online. Now that's, I, I don't know how to do that. I've tried pleasing two people at once. It don't work sometimes. But then I have to rest and I have to trust Christ that he can do it better than I can through me. With many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You see, they already made the mistakes. God just have them written out for you so that you don't follow in their footsteps. You don't make the same mistakes. And that God sees in you a child that is well-pleasing to Him. Now, you say, well, no, that's not me because uh, I do things. I sin. I uh, turn, to, um, turn to Hebrews 11. I want to tell you what God's looking for. And you know what? It's way too simple. Hebrews 11. Look at verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. How many of y'all want to be in the rapture? Say amen. I'll be honest with you. I'd rather be raptured than die. Okay? I would, rather would. I think death is going to hurt. I don't want to hurt. Rapture, however, is going to feel great. Amen. All right. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Wow. That's what, that's what I want. I, that's my testimony. That's what I want to be. Verse 6. How do you please God? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. How do you please God? By faith. You say, God, I have tried and tried and tried and tried. And I can't do it. I can't do it. I mess up. I fall. God, I can't do it. And God says, I know. You see, I didn't make you strong. I made you weak so that I could be strong in you and that everybody, when they see you, they're not praising you. They're praising me, God. That's what Paul was getting at in 2 Corinthians, or, yeah, 2 Corinthians 12. So believe me and trust, it is as simple as trusting God in everything. Lord, you, you, you brought us out here to kill us. Here's Pharaoh over here. Here's the No. I'll show you what I'm going to do. God opened up the Red Sea. And so now he led them to a place and there is no water anywhere. And they said, okay, God, oh, they, that was great. You brought us across the Drink seawater. Now you've got to a place where there is no water at all. What'd you do? Bring us out here to kill us with thirst? No. I brought you out here to show you that on this trip, you're not going to make it if you don't trust me. I'll do something that I'm going to show the elders and they won't believe it. They'll, they'll just be going... Moses struck the rock, water comes out, and, and I don't mean like a little trickle of water. I'm talking about Niagara Falls pouring down on those people and them swimming in it because they ain't bathed in a while. Amen? And the elders are going, did you see that? And the elders went down and told the people, you should have seen what we saw. Moses struck the rock, water coming out of a rock. And right then, it, it should have been obvious to everybody, you and I included, that God's always going to do something that you never thought or anticipated. But what He's going to do is going to be so miraculous, it'll blow your mind. 
And you will say, you know what? I want to trust God. I want to trust God. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, come before you today and thank you, God, for bringing us together into your place. This is, this is your house. We love your house. We love being with these people. Lord, these are our friends. And Lord, I love it. God, that the service is always late getting started. And it's because everybody comes in and they just want to shake hands and fellowship and visit. And God, I'm, I'm all for that. And thank you, God, that you've given us just a spirit here of love for one another, a spirit of liberty, freedom, dear God, from bondage, freedom from man's religions, freedom from works, bondage, salvation, freedom from those who would have us tempt you, Father, we just like being free. And we don't want to be in bondage again. I know I don't. So, Father, lead us always in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And always, Father, always make it so that we have absolutely no choice whatsoever but to trust you because we don't know the way. We tried. We tried to find it. We tried to do it our own way. And it didn't work. So Father, Lord, for all these that are praying to you today, for whatever reason, they know, Lord, where they want to be. And they're not there yet. But Lord, you know the way. And you'll show them the way. And you'll satisfy them. And you'll bless them. But Lord, teach us. How in the most difficult of life's circumstances, teach us how to just trust you and to believe in you. Bless this message, bless these people this morning in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.